Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Get Out of Rap. Today, I'm joined by a friend of mine, Beverly Hughes, who happens to be a contact centre expert. We're, we're going to hear all about her um, career, and you'll understand why. I do, it's, it's a term that is bandied around a lot, but this one I can absolutely 100% say fits, because um, whatever the topic, whatever the... Um, field that you're talking about whether it's operations technology the meeting of the two agents team leaders um bev is someone that i would recommend you go and speak to because she's always willing to talk to you is and is a lovely person and with that big build up ta-da <laughs> thank you for coming on thanks martin yeah she's always prepared to have a view and, and give you it <laughs> <laughs> yes not backward and coming forward. <laughs> yeah, etc. Straight talking, all of that. Now this is our this is our our second attempt at this, isn't it? We 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 kind of got halfway through, and um, internet problems and things that everyone can relate to these days prevented yeah. us. But I think you know what, everything happens for a reason, and it's given us certainly given me more time to get to know you on a on a on a personal level, and um, I'm I'm really looking forward to this because I. I love how passionate you are about our industry. I love that you're um, like a, a straight shooter. So has that always been the case of you? And Oh, actually, yeah. Has that always been the case? First question. Right. <laughs> uh, oh, that's the first question. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Was I always the gobby one at school? Yes. Was I always the first to volunteer for things where I was the star of the show? Yeah, I wanted to be an actress as a kid. Oh really? So, you know, yeah, the whole smell of the crowd or all the grease paint kind of stuff. I I I loved that so much until until mum and dad found out how much it's gonna to cost to send me to RADA, and that was the end of that. Um and, and I had drama lessons and then I, I needed money, so I got a Saturday job and that was the end of that. So, you know, there's a theme here. But um but yeah, no, um I I think my parents uh gave me the skills to just act like a grown-up quite early on so I, I actually remember saying to school friends oh, I'm not a child no I'm a grown-up <laughs> so, I, I, I had this sort of like older head on my young shoulders which is which is kind of handy for getting into pubs when I was 13. <laughs> What's the second we, question? Help. We had very similar backwards well do you know what I was just something you said there um really hit me and it was before recording we we were having a chat and it kind of went all places didn't it including politics and it's something you said then isn't it wouldn't it be great if we had a society where um cost didn't preclude people from pursuing a a, a dream because that that for me is the true meaning of kind of equity or equality is that everyone starts from the same position but everyone has viable access to the means by which they could decide they mm -hmm. could how many talented people are there that have never had the opportunity to live their true life yeah. because they've been because they're prohibited by background finances uh, yeah. you know access to all of these things yeah um you know I, I i felt with the acting thing at the time i was you know that was absolutely everything i wanted to do but you know even people who go to rada right they they, they don't hit the big time and and they don't um you know a small percentage have got regular work and stuff so yeah. you know perhaps i dodged the bullet um I, i've always um found myself busy doing doing something um so but you're right it, it was it was a it, it did feel like I couldn't progress in that way without going to the right school at the, you know yeah, yeah. by the right people um but that isn't always the case and and I um I was, I was listening to a Dan Cohen episode just this morning um and he was talking about his career start and not not dissimilar um I left school with five O levels and, and um, I'd started college for, for doing A-levels in economics and sociology. I was particularly 
I got a comedy, mm. sociology, and art was just the filler, right? Um, but uh, I I quit college after three months when my parents split up, you know, and I figured, hang on a minute, I'm I'm stuck here at home with dad, and that ain't gonna last, <laughs> that isn't gonna work. So I better go and find a job. So so I did. So. And I, I remember talking to my friend's dad, who was a professor in haematology and then a member of the World Health Organization. Wow. Like, yeah, <laughs> and a god. And I, I said how I rude the fact that I didn't go on to university. And he said, but you've got other skills, Bev, mm. where, look, you know, you, you find it easy to talk to me, where some people might find that intimidating or you'll go into a situation and you just get get chatting so the early mm. networking thing mm. so he he gave me probably the the confidence boost rather than actually my own dad at that time to sort of say just just be you crack on you've got different skills and going to university you know it isn't the be all and end all so so yeah from a from about 19 I figured that okay my course was set and I just needed to make a go of whatever career I ended up in and and, and it wasn't going to be Hollywood. Well, I'm still waiting to be discovered. Well, well, exactly. There's still time. But the stage is lost is contact centre industries oh, gain, right? You. You're good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I just, want, I just want to go back. And that um, was was the decision to leave college when, uh, and at 19. Was that when you came into the industry then? No, well, actually, I was seventeen when I when I seventeen. Came. Sorry. Yeah. So no, that's right. I started in the civil service, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, as it was back then, a uh, local big employer. Um, and um, yeah, I got I left there. They used to have this archaic system of for promotion. Maybe they still do. You, you sat an exam, and um, the pass mark was determined by the number of vacancies for the level you were shooting for across the country. So I'd like to tell, say that, that in the year that I took the exam, there were very few vacancies. And so that pass mark was incredibly high. So I yeah. plunked it. So it's like, oh, cracky, another year of being a CA, clerical assistant on three mm. grand a year. Um, this is the mid eighties. And I thought, I'm sat next to people who were on the same money as me doing who are doing less putting less effort in than me mm -hmm. and so me being uh, in charge of me said well that that doesn't cut it I'm off to the private sector screw this public sector malarkey so I went <laughs> to the insurance company as a customer service advisor or whatever we were called in those days but this is pre-contact center so I started on the phones in a customer services department but it was literally one of those oh hang on the phone's ringing yeah you're going to get it? No, I'll get it, you know, or running across the office to get the phone, you know. So um, so I started in, in there and I was with that uh, Canadian insurance company for six or seven years until a vacancy. I took voluntary redundancy when they were reorging and uh, there was a vacancy for a staff trainer in a company called CPP in London, which had a contact center, a call center in those days. Yeah. But I joined there as a staff trainer, um, doing all those old fashioned, you know, internal customer courses and telephone skills courses and things like that. Um, until I, did, I ran the induction course and in the induction, I would get senior heads of, in the business to come and do a half hour on what, what their department did. And the MD, um, uh, was just this live wire of a character, a guy called Martin Fielding, and he totally got me, and I, I got him, and, and his his rambling um, half hour, he was all over the shop, so we... <laughs> uh, and a vacancy came up in the uh, call centre, someone went on mat leave, and he, he approached me and said, do you want to have a go at running the 24-7 call centre? You don't have to be here, obviously, 24-7, um, we do have a shift pattern, but I, I would end up, you know, doing the handover in the morning at 7 or 8 a.m. with the, the night team today. Mm -hmm. And then some days it was just so busy that you still were there, yeah. guys coming yeah. in the evening. And that whole bars of the call centre 
you know, knowing what your grade of service was, as it was referred to, the GOSS. I'll tell you a funny story. So the chairman was a very posh gentleman called Hamish, and he would frequently call the call centre one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, when he'd come back from the club. Um, and just to make sure that pe people were in there doing really, this. yeah, 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 or you know, just under the guise, <laughs> a drunk, posh mystery yeah. shopper. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, always my favorite. And uh, and he rang it and he got Kirsten, my, my Scottish team leader, one night. Hello, Kirsten, how are you? <laughs> and she's like, All right, yeah, Hamish, how are you? Fine, what's the goss? And she said, well, this drinks ban's gone down like a fire. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she just completely missed what he meant by it. So anyway, um, <laughs> so that was uh, the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, and I, Martin, that I spoke of, um, rest his soul, he's not with us anymore. He had moved on to Cytel. Now we're getting to names that you've heard of, right? Um, and um, I had left CPP. I'd gone to work for the AA just because it kind of suited where I was living. And then he called me up one day and said that we're recruiting in a, the account management department. I need an account director in financial services, which is always my the area that I felt most comfortable with. Mm. Um do you want to come and work for me again? Uh, please come and work for me again. <laughs> um, so I strung it out for a few days to get more money. And then I ended up, <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, well, I was only there sadly for a year because Cytel having just acquired decisions um, were making all sorts of changes. And they took the account management function down from 54 people across account directors, managers and execs from 54 to six in, in one night, <laughs> the wow. night of my lives, yeah. And I wasn't one of the six, unfortunately. Um, uh, important people like Mike Havard were <laughs> one of the six, but um, people like me and Keith Gate, we were in the uh, 48 that were out the door that day. So, um, so I ended up going into manufacturing for a few years as a running a customer service de uh, department until contact centers sort of, um, called me lured me again um and by a circuitous route i ended up um contracting to axa ppp healthcare and i stayed as a consultant to them uh, for nine years can you believe it um, wow yeah and that was they had set up something um which was kind of popular at the time in terms of the cash plans health cash plans you get money back for your trips to the dentists and opticians um, so if you couldn't afford PMI, it was like a, well, it wasn't even a mini PMI, but it was, it was just a good product, right? Yeah. Um, and they had really industrialized the sale of that through outbound telemarketing. Somebody else had gone in there to set that up. And I was just sort of hanging on their coattails, learning everything about outbound. Um, and we had 11 call centers, uh, BPOs under management, flogging the same product, splitting the data across the UK, India and Canada. Um, and I really cut my teeth on on, on mm. doing that that project for for nine years. It morphed into some other stuff for them in the Sun Life division, um, but that uh, that really was a good good grounding. I never I never knew you did outbound as well because that's a lot of my career was doing um, was doing outbound, and that's uh, that's a tough gig. <laughs> yeah. it was a very industrialized. Uh, process and um but yeah it was it's funny it's something you said on um the podcast this morning and i don't know when this will go out but obviously it, it's episode 121 listener um, <laughs> uh, you're more professional than me <laughs> well you know darling i i, I was at art school um now i've forgotten what it was that you said on on, on that oh uh, sorry that's all right Is it about outbound it was about outbound. It was about agents pulling every trick in the book to to you know um, massage their performance. Uh, oh, was it about trying to devise 
You were trying to devise a, a remuneration, a bonus scheme. That's it. Can you hurry up and give us it? Like I said, I'm trying to make one that's like unbreakable. It's like a, a prison that you can't break out of, and they get someone that's broken out of prisons to design it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just couldn't and, do it. But that's the thing that the, you know the outbound experience and the actual experience that you taught me is that you know no matter how perfect you think you you're going to set up the campaign, put the right KPIs in place, um, get it all singing and dancing, you know. There will be some agents uh, who will gain, who know mm. how to gain yeah. uh, the system, usually around things like the dispositioning, you know, what's constituted a con contact and what's not a contact, you know, and all of that jazz. Um, and that's fine. We, you know, we would do red, amber, green, and we would look at the reports and you could see, and I would always be, I mean, this is pre um um analytics or at least we couldn't afford analytics and so i was manually you know monitoring the the performance and looking at my agent pool and sort of thinking hang on a minute how can that person be constantly you know out ahead or yeah and sometimes it would be a real shocker right because you'd have someone who was just genuinely bucking the trend in terms of the right thing to do on the phone and they were mm. hitting the number and mm. you're like I, I just it doesn't make sense but they are what they are but yeah. nobody else can emulate them so mm. so fine the your middle your middle raft of people who are roughly within 10 percent of one another the you know putting a solid performance and then there's some turnover at the bottom yeah you know, <laughs> that that really you you want to see what's going on there so um so yeah i would do lots of manual performance management side by side mm -hmm. Um, and I love it. And I know you're smiling now. The thoughts, the, the memories of working in, the, you know, at the coal face on the ground in, in the call centre, that buzz, the stuff you hear, the stuff you find out. There's nothing like it. Nothing no. else. No. And I think, you know what, it's, it, it is because you, 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 you paint a picture that just sets off so many kind of uh, memories and you know, just that's where I was, I think, happiest in. Even as, as my role started to progress, I would still, I can remember one contact centre director said to me, you've got an office, you know that, you're just never in it. I, I always come by and you're never in it. You haven't even got any of your stuff in there. Where are you? And it was because I just was on the contact centre floor, sat down near people and you can... I can remember just you'd be near someone and you, you knew they were getting to that point of the sale and the people around them would all be like watching. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> no, but I do, with that, I do want to take you back to something you said. It was fascinating. And it was around, um, it maybe was at the time when the bug bit that you ended up doing really, really long hours. Because I think, again, that's something that I thought, God, I've thought about this before. I would often start at eight o'clock for the eight o'clock shift. I'd still be at work at eight in the evening without even really knowing it. Yeah. And you, and you just wonder, because you said, you know, you do the morning and then yeah. all the way through to the day. You wonder how many people are out there in our industry now that are doing so many more hours than they're contracted to do just for the, the, the love of the, the game, you know. Yeah, it, I mean it's not sustainable, and and it's no. you know, and when you're in your twenties, that's why I'm bold. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is this is a week. Um, I, 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 I um I lived in London, that so that call centre was on the King's Road. Can you believe it? Above wow. Wakefield on the King's Road. Um, saw I didn't see him, but one of my colleagues saw Johnny Depp. Um, really. As an aside, yeah. The <laughs> storm model agency were on the floor below us, I think, or above us, and that was when he was dating Kate Moss. And I digress. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's not sustainable, but I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people because it kind of... You need the continuity, right? You, you need to um, be seeing the life cycle of what's going on in in the call center um and you it becomes part 
of you you're sort of part of its yeah. dna that there's an ebb and a flow you know whether you've got yeah. seasonality whether you get peaks in the week or certain things happen that you know you know marketing send out a mailer to to the client base all in one dump right great and those yeah. are landing on a tuesday morning or something like that you know and suddenly it's like your spidey senses are telling you hang on a minute hang on a minute <laughs> a lot of calls about the same thing um you know and then it's like well you're all in right because what you're going to do they're out there that the yeah letters have hit um uh, um and so yeah it just and it's such a i mean i'm thinking back to the team that i worked with then you know we were such a gang mm. such a, um um and then then you know maybe <laughs> you'd go down the pub with the day team it's like i'll just do the handover for the evening shift right i'll be i'll be there make it a bacardi and coke you know i'll be there in 10 and just that that's why that guy yeah. uh, is it robert mayhew the the digital marketing guy that does the tiktoks on linkedin i hope i've got his name right because i love his little vids this little 30 seconds of office life and it's just yeah I know it's a digital agent, a marketing agency, but there's a lot of similarity there. And I yeah. just, that just reminds me of what it was like to be in the call centre back in the day. Because, of course, I haven't stepped into a call centre um, for, it's getting on for three years now. Um, after the AXA experience, uh, then I was, then I went to B2B agency. Um, won't talk about them wasn't a very nice place you can find them on linkedin um then i crikey what did i do after that martin this is it see it's all these <laughs> um oh i don't have to pull up my cv oh well, I ended, well, yeah no i ended up contracting i ended up doing a couple of contract gigs what are you gonna say no i was just gonna say this kind of story um career like kind of getting really into it lots of variety but also the ups and downs you know as well as the ebbs and flows of work but the ups and downs of redundancy leading to other oh. things and changes and stuff like that yeah. you and and this and the guy martin sort of that got you and sought you out and and things like that you must have learned in that period a hell of a lot about leadership and what good leaders look like, but also what I guess the alternative was like yeah. as well. What what kind of what was it about? Um, let's take Martin, but what take Martin? What was it about him that kind of? Well, Mar Martin was just a. Com a larger than life character <clears throat> with a big basil brush laugh you know big booming laugh i think <laughs> just on on that level we gelled um just a, a silly sense of humor but you know as a as a leader um he would he was probably probably didn't think of himself as as a as a leader at all uh, but what i did learn from him um was the power of networking um we would do after many years after um I, I would go to meetings with him when i was freelance as he would say just to balance up the table because he didn't want to look like a one-man band right he wouldn't pay me for it uh, <laughs> but it was all good experience right he was trying yeah. to do various things he had fingers in pies and stuff like that mm. and, and so i i would go along and and just that what i learned from him again yeah you never never only on a rare occasion should you cut up a business card and chuck it in the bin because <laughs> I never want to speak to that person ever again. Keep everything. I've got drawers full of like business cards from people long since forgotten. LinkedIn is phenomenal for mm. just thinking, oh, you know, who is that person that knew such and such, you know, try and find them. Hang on a minute. They've unlinked me. You know, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, very actually very few, as we know, of our net network on LinkedIn actually uses the damn thing and so yeah it's a good directory um so I learned that um you he was followed by good leaders in you know um uh, Derwin Jones who was at Cytel who actually I've got to say this because it's a running joke 
It, we're coming up for 25 years since Derwin Jones made me redundant. And he knows I know the date and I remind him. <laughs> so next March, uh, next February, Derwin, <laughs> there will be events to mark the anniversary next February. Um, but Derwin uh, ended up back in my career some years later through, uh, you know, I was in um, a situation and somebody said, why don't you tap up Derwin? He knows a lot of people in the industry, see what he's got to, to say and who he might introduce you to. And, and um, again, over time, something cropped up where he needed some help. He put out a call to me and I, and I ended up going into um, Ultracoms. Um, I did some work with him when he was at Parsec. And then the following year, uh, he was uh, in Ultracoms, who needed a real turnaround. They'd sort of uh, hit some hard times and, and they were losing money. I went, he said, maybe there's a couple of weeks worth of work. Can you come in and have a look at the client base and see how we could turn around the account management? <clears throat> and I went there and, and ended up with a three month uh, contract and that turned into a permanent role which was for five years before we were bought by Babel in 2021. So, so yeah, so to get back to the question about his, his leadership, what, what Derwin gave me was a more rounded view of how businesses operate. Because if, if you're going to go through an acquisition um, and you're, on, you're the ones being acquired, um, mm. and I can say this in all honesty you try to put forward obviously the best of what your company looks like you don't tell the entire truth right everybody knows that but not, neither do you lie because there is a, a stringent due diligence process so what Derwin taught me and others in the management team was how to handle yourselves during that process of, of due diligence um, and also of course you've been so you've been given then level of responsibility um and on top of that you can't tell everyone what's going on which no. is the biggest responsibility to to work towards a goal um it, which might not come off um to carry on managing the business on a day-to-day -day basis and uh not not be too faced about it and, and commit to things that you can't deliver against you know we, there were things we needed to invest in but only if we were going to stick around for another five, 10 years. So how do you tell someone that you're not going to spend £60,000 on a server upgrade um, with the, when they're crying out for it? You know, just got to manage that information. So I learned a heck of a lot in the last five or six years going through that process with, with him at the helm. Um, and that's, that's the responsibility, I guess. One of the unknown, well, untalked about responsibilities of leadership, isn't it? It's kind of the, how do you show up still with integrity um, and answer those questions when someone says to you as the leader, we really need this server. And you say, okay, <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, that was just one example that sticks in my mind. I mean, there were lots of, there was a lot, of positive in the Ultracoms experience here, because it's really nice to get things rocking and rolling such mm. that you're in a position to scale the business, right? It, mm. it, you know, the, fundamentally, the technology was built uh, uh, on, you know, on, on old infrastructure uh, in a way that you wouldn't build it today. You know, mm. if you're, if you're um, groundbreaking to a degree in uh, um, a technology such as cloud, then the next guy that comes along is going to do it quicker and faster and cheaper because it's you're no longer at the cutting edge so um so there there had to be there, there was a common perception in the business that you know we were we were just holding some things together with um, string and sellotape at times um but again is, is, isn't that the way though isn't that what yeah. we all do to some extent yeah but th but that makes for a great team dynamic right yeah and, yeah and I, I had dinner with the guys uh the old ultracoms uh, guys who, who are now at Babel. um i i saw them a few weeks ago and you know it's it's just like slotting straight back into the, the old gags and and the sort of mickey taking that 
that goes on. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what the question was, Martin. <laughs> no, this is really good because it's, it's around the kind of um, the squiggly career, but also, mm. also something that that professor said to you has just come out in spades already in this, in this period, in this little forty minutes now is your your skill in building relationships and that well what we now know is emotional intelligence right and just kind of yeah everything that you've talked about is in connection relationship um working with people and it's so evident in in what you're talking about now and I think for people listening who may be a start in their career um mm. it must be reassuring because you've had you're successful and it's but it's it's been done everyone seems to think successful people have a linear line up in their career it's not the case at all is it no but no. But, but across all of it is just you who you are and the importance of people and the relationships you have with them i was thinking i i took voluntary redundancy I've been made redundant twice i think i've been sacked once well let's just say i didn't pass my probation uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um you know so and and then and then you're faced with okay, so where do we go now? How do we take that? I mean, I, I being made redundant is unpleasant, yeah. and I would say uh, the first time it happened, you know, like a bolt out of the blue, um, ah, I was in a bad way going into the next role or going for yeah. the interviews for the next role because I felt like it was all on me, and and, yeah. and so the the older you get and the more wise to the way in which businesses are run that you become the more you can kind of get a sense of the writing on the wall or just what to be aware of what you know hopefully what, what not to what traps not to fall into um but also a huge dose of fatalism or whatever you want yeah. to call it that you know it'll it'll sort itself out the, these things do um, which is really tough to hear when I, I know for some people I've been talking to a few people that have connected with me in the last um, few weeks and months you know some some from your list of people looking for roles um, and others who've just approached me thinking that I can hire them um, um, and it's, and it's hard hard situation to be in and I and I empathize as I said in my piece when I worked in in um in Paris as you pointed mm. earlier yes how, how delightful that is to sort of say yes I'm off to Paris for a gig now, when that job came along I'd been out of work for seven months I didn't have the proverbial pot to piss in and a good friend of mine lent me some money so I could survive until they paid me because I think they're on two month payment terms which again somebody else managed to negotiate down for me somebody within in the client structure so um so yeah the elation of landing a, a gig and it's in Paris and then thinking yeah how am I going to afford to fly out there well, I, I actually took the Eurostar every every week that was fun that was when they were setting fire to the tunnels do you remember yeah what was the story so if people haven't seen it, go and check out um, Bev's LinkedIn post. But there's a photo of you <laughs> outside a cafe. And it's like it is like a film star's photo. What's the story behind that? Yeah, no, no, that's me, Martin. I don't know where I know it's, it's you. Is, but it's actually Bridget Bardot. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> I just I, I have um, a habit of just being a bit of an outlier and, and making well making fun of the situation right um yeah. making hopefully not taking myself too seriously but um uh, when i when i put together the mullard associates brand eight years ago when i was freelance i had a website that was uh, bigger than it is today um but i said to the web designer i said i just want to convey that I'm a bit of an old fashioned girl at heart, really. I just want, I hark back to those days when um, you, there was just less corporate bollocks, <laughs> being spoken, <laughs> more acronyms, that, yeah. that less posturing and trying to look clever, and that we just got down to brass tacks. You just said it how it was, you know, yeah. not 
not in a rude sense, but just said, here's the problem that we're dealing with here. You know, you've got someone in a leadership role who's who's pretty toxic, right? And and that's your problem, really. We all yeah. have this problem. So yeah. let's not gussy it up by saying it's a technology thing or it's an employee engagement thing or it's, you know, let's actually brass tacks look at what the what the problem is. So um so anyway, so he he uh with the original website just we, we went down the sort of um retro feel about it and, and did some stuff around um talking plainly but um yeah so i know whenever i ask people and you always have to ask for a linkedin recommendation um they always come out with something about you know Bev's a straight talker or she's and i say try not to say that because it does make <laughs> it awfully um common um but i but i am right um and hopefully I... nicely there's this thing I read actually this morning about um, it's razors. I only ever understood the term razors to be something I shaved my head with, but it's about like the, I think this one is called the crony razor or something. And it's basically avoid or people that use overly long words um, when in fact that you should, if you can't explain, if you can't explain something clearly that a five-year-old can understand it, then you should go back and and rethink it and it's that no. kind no i disagree wholeheartedly use the right word in the right context let and me see if i can find a bit it learning <laughs> then go get a dictionary and learn the word i got a dictionary when i was 10 years old as a christmas present and i still got it um what kind of a geek am i it's called the fenian razor oh. uh, complexity and jargon are used to mask a lack of deep understanding um if someone uses a lot of complexity and jargon to explain oh, something they they probably right. don't understand it yeah, and i uh, think that i think that points to the point you were making around yeah. wanting to hark back to just saying it as it is so you you wouldn't take that example there's your problem everyone knows it it's this leader he's totally disengaged everyone there you go yeah rather than and then count you don't need to couch that up in a 27 page report right no, no. No, sorry, I misunderstood you, um, which is ironic. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, that was uh, my fault. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. Um, using jargon and, and flowery business language to, to, I got sent, somebody sent me a job description the other day. It's just really sweet of them to think of me and said, you, you might want to, you want, might be interested in this. And I won't name the company, but it's a software solution. And I, I said, you know what? Um, if I could understand what the hell they were talking about, I might. <laughs> Honestly, I said it's not for me because clearly I'm Googling some of the phraseology in there <laughs> yeah. to know. But it was so, so full of business bullshit that yeah. I, that really, really frustrates me. Now, um, I, I, I will. I will admit that, you know, I'll try to keep up with um, the common, the current vernacular. Um, and I'm really I've been a bit of a late adopter on all things uh, technological but you know I get by and if I don't understand the uh, CR, uh, uh, an acronym in in, um, in something then I'll ask you know what yeah. are we talking about now yeah. there was one yeah. a while ago with lots of um, CX related acronyms it's like we've got BCX we've got CX and then we've got BCX and we've got this it's like oh Please, can we just <laughs> somebody just explain to me what it what it is? And VCX actually is vulnerable customer service, vulnerable customer experience, as I understand it. Um, we were talking about this morning. I think that really is key, and just yeah. point that we were talking about um, previously. I think it really is important today more than ever that we do get that bit right around. Um, people's situations and uh, um and we were saying about the the difficulty now with people literally balance balancing their household budget um uh in a in a in a time when there's complexity in the contact center you 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 posted something last week uh, an article around somebody purporting to say that our industry is on the brink of collapse. Yeah. We won't go into to, to that, but it's if it's a very 
stressful time for everyone at the moment um, with the pressures on us outside of work that we really need to focus on how we deal with that in the call centre, in the contact centre arena, so that we're mindful of what's happening with our customers as much as we are with the agents who, who are having to deal with it. Um, and it's probably, you know, there's another hour's worth of debate over that. Well, we, you know, I, I, I completely agree. It's always struck me as a bit odd that um, people will write content and they'll say where we're heading is agents will be uh, problem solvers and they will deal with more complex stuff. They will, the transactional side of things will be picked up more by automation and bots and self-service, meaning our uh, humans, customer facing team members will get to deal with the really meaty stuff and blah, blah, blah. And then it just ends, right? And it's, it, it, it's, not, it's still not that long ago that I can remember um, being an agent or work, certainly working closer with agents where, you know what, the, they wouldn't, they're not necessarily going to be excited about that if it doesn't come with being paid a decent wage. Mm. And it's kind of like we write, some of this content is written in isolation where it says, here's what the agent of the future will look like. Isn't that great? And do you know what? Yes, it is because they're using their brains. We've, we're better using people's capabilities but if we're if that doesn't come with a subsequent increase in pay, so what? You know, it's still not going to make our industry attractive to people. We are still going to have agent attrition, and the cost of living crisis. You know, me and you were talking about it. We were talking about this beforehand. The cost of living crisis is very, very real, but perhaps not in the upper echelons of LinkedIn. Is it so real? And we, it would be very, very wrong of us to forget that we've got people who are the core of our industry who are struggling right now and are going to struggle further in the winter when energy prices, energy prices go up yeah. and we need to do something about it. Yeah. Well, I know you're, you're championing this and you're, you, you know, you're at the forefront in, of the discussions around it, but we really have to do something not just talk about it and yeah. I, um, I, I said to you I'm super conscious of just being part of an echo chamber that, yeah. that falls on about all the you know great things to be in the contact center and, and how we should look at this and that but I'm itching to to try to enact that and, and to do something and as you said you know the people for whom this is smack bang in, in front of them they're not on LinkedIn right they're, they're busy getting that um that that quota done you know and achieving that aht um they're not they haven't got the time to fanny around looking at linkedin content and you know worry about whether there's a smiley emoji or not i mean crikey i'm, I'm using it now but <laughs> yeah i have got the luxury of time to do that at the moment but um but uh but yeah it's it's not an easy problem to, to solve over, but well, certainly not one we can solve overnight. I think we've just got to be mindful and caring about um, individuals who already had a tough uh, job and it is going to be uh, harder, but I've heard it all before. What are we actually going to do to, to resolve? Mm. So, so that's mm. something that we're giving some serious thought to. Um, certainly in, you know, my freelance capacity opening up those conversations around uh um vulnerability the fca's um ruling or, or, or um recommendations will be out this month in terms of the consumer duty um they're pretty um vehement that it's this isn't just about a you know nice to have yeah we we sort yeah. of we take it into consideration they're going to companies are going to need to evidence um uh how they have um adopted a, a fairer way of dealing with people with you know disclosed vulnerabilities so it'd be interesting to see how companies are going to um deal with that in the financial services sector mm. so yeah there's 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 a lot on the go in the industry at the moment and i would say as well because i know you probably wouldn't but for people out there who 
might want to get a steer on that and also make sure that they're uh, up to date and going to be on the right side of these new regulations, then um, you should contact Bev and get her in to have a, uh, a look at your operation. Because one thing is, is you'll be certain of is straight talking, a straight talking way to the solution, which I think is perfect, isn't it? Well, you know, some companies don't want that. I, I, um, <laughs> I tread a fine line um, and I am respectful of, of people running their businesses, how they choose to run it. And, and, and they can take my view as one of hopefully many views of, of, of what is going on. There has to be a reason why they kind of contacted me in the first place. Something isn't quite right. Um, they're not just going to, you know, chew the fat well some do but um but i i do i love the challenge of um looking at you know why the balance sheet has taken a, a dive and unpicking that or um or looking ahead to what's what's coming by way of different regulations or or um different trends in the industry you know how we're going to overcome because I just love that process. I love working with people who yeah. you take the time to plan um, and uh, and solve those problems. So that you know that is the fun part of being independent. Um, I'm sure if I end up back in a role where I'm directly responsible for an operational or, or a client servicing function or whatever you uh, whatever you choose, that you just kind of get. I just get wrapped up in it and then there's less yeah. time to stand back and actually look at um, who, who's the guy that says about working um, in the business rather than on the business, you know. So so I, I've got those two halves to my brain. I'm either in there like, right, let's get rid of that. Let's sort that out. Right, you, you know what you're doing. Go off and do it. I love that active direction and, and yeah. of leadership. Um, but similarly, I like the, I'm, I'm an outsider looking in because so, then I can say pretty much what I like, you know, um, uh, no holds barred. So, yeah, you've got to temper it slightly. I love it. And I, I used to, I said to a, a friend of mine um, about communication styles. I love an analogy. And I came up with one that said, he, I said, you need to be less B road and more motorway, right? So the both routes get there. But mm. one of them just goes around every village or um, tourist attraction. <laughs> Another is just the M1, just A to B. And I would say, I would say you're more motorway and A roads rather than <laughs> rather than the the B roads and, and footpaths. So um, I've lo I've loved chatting to you, and I think um, we it, it took me too long to get from the aborted attempt this one so i appreciate your i appreciate your patience i would love to do um another one with you in a short period if we can do that relatively soon because i think there's some there's some other topics that we that we both like to talk about and we've talked to with each other um so i'd love for you to come back and, and do it again but like i say if you're listening and you um, want to get a view on where you're at and the, the right course of action to take, you would be, you know, I would recommend you speak to Bev, definitely. Because, and you're always open for a chat with people anyway, aren't you? I, I do love to talk and we've, we've still got to um, agree on whether we're going to go for the, the long haul. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, I, I thank you so much for having me on. It's that like you start out this session thinking, what on earth are we going to talk about? And <laughs> yeah. Listen to me. Hopefully they don't end with <laughs> that sentiment. Thank you very much, Bev. And um, we will speak again very shortly. All right. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.